Hey there everybody, I'm Joe the Disney Guy and welcome to another edition of Disney Guy Reviews. Today we'll be looking at the great prince of the forest, Bambi. In 1923, an Austrian author, Felix Salton, published Bambi, A Life in the Woods, a work about a young deer and his trials and tribulations growing up in the forest. In 1928, the book was translated into English, and five years later, MGM producer and director Sidney Franklin purchased the film rights to Bambi for $1,000. Salton should have held out. Fifty Shades of Grey got over $5 million. Franklin wanted to make a live-action version of Bambi, but after years of experimenting, he began to realize that a story so reliant on the emotions portrayed by animals just wouldn't be possible to do in live-action. Franklin thought that the story would be better served if it were animated, so in April of 1937, he decided to take it to the king of animation, Walt Disney. Disney fell in love with the story and decided that he wanted to make Bambi into a feature. Originally, Walt wanted Bambi to be his follow-up to Snow White, but issues with adapting the relatively dark story and animating realistic deer continually pushed the project back. One day, animators Frank Thomas and Milt Call nervously brought to Walt pencil tests of Bambi moving. After watching, Walt said with tears in his eyes, That's pure gold, boys. And on August 17, 1937, production on Bambi as the studio's fifth animated feature finally began in earnest. It quickly became apparent that adapting Bambi into a film would be much more difficult than their previous features. The head of Disney's story development, Ted Sears, encouraged the creative team to stay away from directly telling the story told in the book, but to rather, quote, write a symphony based on the book. The continual problem, however, was reining in the story to make sure that the focus stayed on Bambi. For example, an entire sequence of an anthill being destroyed and the effect it had on the ants was planned and storyboarded before Walt and company finally realized that it had nothing to do with Bambi. So that's not entirely fair. I mean, technically it was Bambi who destroyed the anthill and in the process killed hundreds of innocent talking ants. So, yeah, I guess painting your main character as an irresponsible murderer would be a bad decision. The original book was also quite dark at times and Walt wrestled with just how much to show in the movie. Originally, scenes such as actually seeing Bambi's mother shot and seeing a man burned to death by the fire he accidentally started at the end of the film were included in the movie before being cut due to Walt feeling that the audience didn't actually need to see those scenes and that many of them were more powerful without the visual. The most difficult part of Bambi's development, however, was actually animating Bambi and the other animals. Walt wanted the animals to be a blend of realistic and cartoonish that had never been done before. To do this, he had his animators visit the Los Angeles Zoo to study how the animals moved, and even brought in a host of animals into the studio itself, including two fawns, appropriately named Bambi and Faline. Walt should have done this for every feature, though I could see how getting an elephant named Dumbo and a dragon named Pete could be tough. Eventually, the right look for the titular deer was truly a collaborative effort. Rico Lebrun, an Italian animal illustrator, was brought in to teach the Disney artist how to realistically animate deer. He showed them his comparative anatomy, which compared the anatomy of a deer to that of a human, in order to help the animators better understand what they were drawing. Animator Bernard Garbutt helped refine the realistic deer look, while fellow animator Mark Davis added human emotions into the character by infusing Bambi's face with the expressions that human babies make. Milt Call blended all these elements together, and the look of Bambi was finalized. Creating the background for Bambi was another struggle for the animators. Originally, the backgrounds were based off of pictures of real forests from Maine and Vermont that the animators had visited, but the extreme attention to detail made the scenes look too busy and distracting on the eye. One day, Chinese-American animator Tyrus Wong, who had been working at Disney as an in-betweener, showed off some of his impressionist paintings of nature. Walt decided that this was exactly what the backgrounds in Bambi needed, and what resulted was a stylized interpretation of a forest with a detailed foreground where the action took place, and an impressionistic background to help direct the audience's attention where it needed to be. And as for Wong, he actually got promoted to the lead artist on Bambi. I bet you every animator in the office was rushing to Walt with their personal paintings after that one. The multiplane camera returned in full force, helping to add depth to the forest and make the audience feel like they were actually in the woods. Various effects were employed as well to help create realistic looking weather, like using cornflakes for snow. But possibly the biggest advancement in animation during Bambi's development wasn't an effect or even a drawing, but an animator themselves. Retta Scott, a woman, actually animated the vicious dog seen towards the end of the movie, making her the first ever woman animator at Disney. But wait, I thought that Meryl Streep told me that Walt Disney was a sexist bigot, and yet he had a woman as an animator on a project as big as Bambi? In 1940? 
The music in Bambi was also done in a unique way compared to the previous Disney features. Frank Churchill returned to compose the music, this time joined by Edward Plum to give the music a mix of both simple and classical styles. With Fantasia still fresh in their minds, the sound effects for things such as wind were done using instruments and vocals, as opposed to in a traditional sound factory. And the songs were all sung off camera by non-characters as a way to advance the plot, a huge shift from movies like Snow White. As for the voice actors, young children who weren't necessarily child stars or even actors were brought in to give the characters more authentic, sincere voices. In fact, Donnie Dunnigan was brought in just to be a character reference for Bambi before Walt decided to give him the voice as well. You talk about your promotions. Unfortunately, it wasn't all good times at the Disney Studios during Bambi's production. While Bambi was being made, three features were released, Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Dumbo, and two of those were financial flops. There was a bitter animator strike that happened in May of 1941, America entered World War II in December of 1941, taking away many of Walt's animators, and in 1939, with funds tight, Walt again needed to convince the bank to give him a loan or Bambi wouldn't even happen. Walt brought in the head of Bank of America, Amadeo Giannini, and pitched to him the story of Bambi. Luckily, Giannini enjoyed Walt's story and decided to give him a loan. Can we start taking a tally for how many times that Walt's storytelling ability saved the company from going under? I mean, it's starting to get a little absurd now. Finally, on August 13th, 1942, Bambi opened in London, England. I think I'll call him Bambi. Bambi. Yeah, but I guess I'm do all right. Bambi was Disney's first interpretation on a recent work, so how does it hold up compared to Disney's features based on classical fairy tales? Well, I will say that the main conflict can be a bit difficult to identify at times. Yes, the issue of man comes up every so often, but those moments tend to be fleeting, and it's not like it's a constant issue that they're trying to work to overcome. That being said, the plot never feels like it's plodding along. Something about watching Bambi explore something new in the forest for every season is enough to keep me interested, and that's quite a feat when you factor in how little dialogue this movie has. And I gotta say, I agree with the decision to never show man. I think it makes him far more threatening, and it really helps keep you in the perspective of the animals and seeing how man affects them, which I think is what the writers wanted you to see. And while we're on the topic of man, everybody remembers the scene where Bambi's mother dies, but check this scene out from later in the movie. He's coming closer. Calm. Don't get excited. We'd better fly. No. No, don't fly. Whatever you do, don't fly. He's almost here. I can't stand it any longer. I'm sorry, but that one is way worse in my opinion. Bambi really is a beautiful movie though. They strive for realism on the animals and I definitely think they got it. Just seeing things like Thumper's little nose twitch is a little detail, but it goes a long way in making you believe in the animals. And when you compare Bambi to say, A Deer from Snow White, a movie that was released only five years earlier, it's staggering how much improvement was made. I gotta say, the only thing that sorta of weirded me out about the animals is their voices after they grew up. Hello, friend Al. Don't you remember me? Remember me? Hi, fellas. Ooh, it just doesn't feel right. I also really enjoyed how the movie subtly uses color and music to let you know exactly what's happening and how to feel. It looks beautiful for one, and it just sets the perfect mood for any scene that takes place. Overall, Bambi is a masterclass on how to draw an audience into a fictional world, and I think it's easy to see why it's still considered to be such a classic. Despite high hopes, Walt watched yet another feature film not be able to make back its budget in Bambi. The film cost the studio $1.7 million to make, and it only brought in $1.64 million. Audiences and critics weren't too fond of the film either in its initial run, blasting Disney for not giving them enough fantasy in the film, which they had become accustomed to. Even Disney's own daughter, Diane, was angry at her dad for allowing Bambi's mother to die. Oh, and uh, Hunters didn't like the film. Can't imagine why. But, as always seems to be the case for Disney movies, time was kind to Bambi. The film was re-released six times, in 1947, 1957, 1966, 1975, 1982, and 1988, and today has currently grossed over $102 million. Of course, the scene of Bambi's mother being shot has forged a legacy all of its own, being parodied and referenced countless times, and rock and roll icon Sir Paul McCartney actually credits the scene with starting his interest in animal rights. And the way I look at it, if it's good enough for a beetle, it's good enough for me. 
Bambi was nominated for three Academy Awards, for Best Original Song with Love is a Song, for Best Original Score, and for Best Sound. The American Film Institute named Bambi as third best animated feature film of all time, and man, their 20th best villain of all time. The Library of Congress entered the film into its National Film Registry in 2011, and Time actually named Bambi onto its list of the 25 greatest horror movies. You know, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, and uh, Bambi. Seems like an obvious connection to me. Nowadays, Bambi still occasionally appears in ads for the United States Forest Service, and the animation on Bambi was so influential to Disney that it was referenced heavily in another coming-of-age tale released in 1994, The Lion King. And it's basically provided the blueprint for the Disney style of animating animals that's still prevalent even today. So although it was a rough start for the great prince of the forest, the effect Bambi had on movies and on popular culture is still felt, even over 60 years later. Well guys, that about wraps it up for me this week. I hope you all enjoyed, and tell me what you think about Bambi. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, check out the new playlist with all the Disney Guy reviews, as well as last week's video and next week's video. And I'll see you all next week.